I usually like to put this disclaimer here. And uh, one of them, them has to do with, right, um, you do not hold me, uh, you know, responsible for any errors or anything like that in the presentation. This uh, presentation is a work in progress. This is the first time that I'm giving this presentation. So uh, please bear with me. Presentation does not endorse or approve um, any of the content, right, information in there. And of course, this presentation does not represent any of the opinions of any of the companies that I have worked for or have worked um, uh, previously as well. And if I do mention any tools, you will use this in a log right, legal, um, professional, ethical way as well. All right, so who am I? I'm, uh, again, healthcare information. I work in healthcare. I've been working for healthcare for about 10 plus years now. And I actually work for an academic medical center that's also um, education as well. So it's really interesting. And um, I also work um, part-time. I teach uh, healthcare information security at uh, Brandeis University as well. And I'm also, um, I've, I've done some conferences in the past. I used to do uh, security besides Boston. And um, yeah, basically it's been really interesting. I also do uh, Boston Application Security Conference and some uh, many other conferences as well. I'm very interested in Internet of Things, medical device security, and application security as well. And um, I also do the OWASP um, Boston meetings as well. And um, you can find me on uh, Twitter, WR0, or uh, websecar at gmail.com. So the agenda, agenda for today is really to talk about, kind of like a give an overview for people that, that uh, are currently in healthcare and also are not currently in healthcare. Uh, talk about the, the difference the, the landscape, right? And then also talk about what are the, some of the laws and regulations and standards that apply to healthcare. And also talk about some of the threats and the threat actors, right? I, basically, I've, I've done some research looking on the web. This is all public information, but I tried to kind of confine it into this presentation, this working presentation. And also talk about some of the attacker tools as well that uh, right, the, these, the attackers are using. And also some information that I found from the research that I've done on going through this uh, public information. Then, then I'll be talking about all of the, I guess the top three, I should say, top four um, healthcare security breaches that have happened in 2015. And then that are over one million, that have breaches that are over one million customers and more. And then I'll give some recommendations and I also want to hear some thoughts and feedback from the, the audience as well. So I, I actually, I went on the web and I tried to look for a uh, kind of like a healthcare landscape, typical healthcare organization landscape, and I couldn't find any because it's so many, it's so diverse, it's so, right, it's so complicated, right? But here, you have to remember that healthcare is all about patients, right? All about patient-centric. It's all about the patients. So anytime you do security, you have to make sure that uh, you know, number one, that people will actually use it. For example, you can't create or use a two-factor authentication on a medical record. For example, when dealing with patient care, when the provider, um, let's say the security team is, is not available and there's something wrong with the two-factor authentication. Um, for example, you have to, kind of like a cost-benefit analysis. So for example, uh, healthcare landscape is very complex. There's so many different uh, devices, so many different legacy machines, so many different new machines as well, and so many different um, interfaces as well that are interfacing with, with the healthcare um, in the hospital, for example. And you have to also have to remember that when you take a look at healthcare, um, now, right, information is trying to be portable. You think, take a look at all the providers, all of the healthcare professionals. They're trying to have their medical record on the iPad on different mobile devices, right? And how do you secure that? And before, remember, the perimeter used to be just, just in the building, around the building, but now in any, typically in healthcare or any industry, right, all of the information now is all, all over, all around us. So here, looking at this uh, diagram, right, uh, patient, right, there, maybe there's a laboratory system, maybe there's a radiology PACS system, for example. Um, there's usually some appointment scheduling billing software attributed to that. Uh, maybe, maybe some orthopedics, pediatric surgery software, and I didn't even put in here the kind of like electronic medical record, right? Trying to be portable, trying to be electronic as well. So electronic healthcare record or EMR, for example, um, again, it provides complete 
uh, you know, patient history. Again, you want to have like some kind of patient history in there. Um, it also improves on the reduction in, in, of hospitals' costs, for example, and also provides providers so that healthcare professionals can collaborate with, with each other, right, in real time as well. And of course, it, it encourages, right, faster decision making in addition as well. Also, there's a lot of health information exchanges, right? How do you deal with data and how do you, how do you securely and effectively share data, right? And when you take, think about healthcare, all the different healthcare organizations, hospitals, they're all using a different electronic medical record, electronic healthcare record, for example. And how do you kind of combine everything? Everyone's using a different technology, for example. And also with the healthcare information exchange, there's a lot of different research that can be used for good. At this rate, it can be used for bad as well, but we'll talk about the good. So a lot, a lot of interesting things with the electronic healthcare record and the EMR. Protect, protected health information, right? Protect, PHI, personal identifiable information. This one I actually want to focus on protected health information. Um, so usually it's, it's a name and any of these, right? Any of these additionally to a name. So for example, member name, city, state, zip code, right? Social security number, medical record numbers, uh, email, you, URL, address, address, date of birth, all of this, right? This is all protected health information. So just think about all the different landscape of healthcare and think about all of the different, uh, you know, all of the different uh, information that you're trying to protect. So um, I also wanted to mention, um, even before I talk about the laws and standards, I forgot to mention that in, yeah, uh, in 2014, the FBI, um, they mentioned, they actually issued a, like a warning, right? It was actually, if you're, uh, how many people are InfraGuard members? Um, yeah, they, okay. They sent uh, kind of like a letter, a warning, and actually they've, they've been sending it. But to, to 2014, they sent a kind of like an email, a letter to notifying that all of the healthcare, healthcare organizations, they're going to be attacked, they're, right? they're going to be breached. Just be, just be very careful, right? I think we've, even before the FBI mentioned this, I think that as security professionals, as technology professionals in any industry, I think we've known, right? There's going to be a breach. Um, the bad guys are already winning, um, so there's going to be a breach, and I'll, I'll talk about that later as well. But regarding the laws and standards, regulations, right, Massachusetts has one of the strictest laws regarding protecting protected health information and personally identifiable information, right? Um, HIPAA, there's HIPAA Health, um, health Information Portability and Accountability Act. There's the, right, it regulates and use the disclosure of protected PHI, and also that is, is protected right by covered entities, um, generally like healthcare organizations, clearinghouse, employee sponsored health plans, and health insurers, for example. And again, right, they, by regulation, the Department of Health and, and um, Human Services, they extended the privacy rule to basically um, independent contractors to kind, kind of like covered entities um, who fit the definition of business associate agreements. So for example, for any of you that deal with uh, business associate agreements, any time that you are working with like a third party or another organization, right, um, you want to be ensure that you are protecting this PHI. So what, what usually happens is that there is a business associate agreement uh, signs that is signed either by your organization and the other third party. Um, usually it comes from your organization or there is another, the company that you're working with, the third party also um, has like a BAA as well. But really it's just kind of like a Think of it as an agreement to make sure that there are different procedures in place if this uh, right, PHI, um, something were to happen and things like that. So pretty interesting there. Of course, in J January 2013, HIPAA also updated, right? They called it the fin final omnibus uh, rule, basically. And of course, there were changes that were um, updated in the security rule and also the breach notifications um, due to the High Tech Act as well. And of course, High Tech Act, right, that stands for the Health Information Technology um, for Economic and Clinical Health. And again, this, this was enacted as part of the American uh, Re Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act of 2009. And um, this went into law in 2009 um, to promote the adoption and of meaningful use. So remember, in healthcare, meaningful use, there's three stages of meaningful use, and I'll probably cover them in the next few slides. But um, in, a, in a nutshell, Meaningful use is to basically get your healthcare organization, your hospital, 
um, using a, a medical record or some kind of electronic uh, healthcare record. And I'll talk about that more in the next few slides as well. After this, right, I already mentioned about this, but this is just excerpts from the warning that FBI mentioned um, from the, regarding healthcare. They observe malicious actors targeting healthcare related systems, right? for the purpose of attaining PHI, PII, all of that. And actors also have been searching, um, have been targeting multiple companies on healthcare. We've seen that, and I'll, I'll talk about the next, uh, the, the next uh, few uh, organizations that have been targeted that we've seen in the news as well. So I think the great, I was trying to look for something that I could reuse because I, I hate to create new things, so I like reusing. But uh, Mandian really put it well regarding the different uh, threats the threat vectors, right, or breaking down the threats or uh, the threat actors. So number one, if you go from left to right, uh, the first one is nuisance, right? These are like, right, spam, botnets, right, maybe denial of service, right? And of course you can see, right, I have a, uh, basically this is from Mandians, but objective, example, targeted, and the character, right? So for example, a nuisance isn't a targeted, it usually happens, like for example, a good example of this is like um, getting all the spam emails in your, in your organization. That would be a nuisance, for example. Next one is data theft. These are objective, right, is to really have a political advantage, right? They're all in it to, to, to make money, economic. It's an APT. I think we've heard a lot of uh, advanced persistent threats. It's usually targeted, and then again, it's always persistent, right? Cyber crimes, uh, again, financial, financial gain, trying to get money. Right, targeted at credit card, PHI, personal identifiable information, and theft. And again, they're financial motivated. Hacktivism, right, we've seen this from the anti-sec, low-sec, all these different groups, anonymous, um, defamation, press, and policy. And again, they're doing website defacements, but uh, you know, again, maybe the, the, the uh, breach or the, the, the attack is not as, as long-standing, for example. And again, the last one is network attacks. Um, again, it's des escalation, destruction, um, destroying critical infrastructure. And then you can see, right, out of these um, five, right, four out of the five are targeted. And then all, all the other ones are, right, either automated or persistent financially, consistent, conspicuous, and all of that. So this is pretty interesting, and I have the information there from Indians. Right, so these are the ones, I think, from what we've seen from the 2015 breaches, right, that that is that actually the these are the threat actors um, impacting healthcare organizations. Number one is the data theft, right? The APTs, the target attacks. It's going to happen even if it hasn't happened already or it's already on your network. Um, and then there's also the financial gain. We've, we've seen this from the the uh, the different breaches that that I'll be talking about in the next few slides. Credit card, PHI, financially motivated. So remember, it's advanced persistent threats and also the financial. Um, liability of all this PHI and personal, personally identifiable information. <coughs> okay, so, yep, so cyber criminals, they, right, they target all of that. And again, right, for the APTs, there's going to be a target, there's going to be te targeting technologies, processes, expertise. They're trying to, right, trying to focus on improving domestic industries' abilities, and then they're, they're focusing on targeting PII. Right, so for insider threats also, so in addition to those two, there's also insider threats, right? Um, how, typical healthcare organization, typical hospital, there's different patients that, are, that come into the hospital or healthcare system. So sometimes they might be really well-known uh, celebrities, for example. So sometimes there are some, right, uh, the hospitals, healthcare organizations, they have a very, um, very strict policy regarding using your healthcare, using the, the access that you have and, and reviewing and looking at different uh, medical records, for example, right? It's, it's really only needed for your job, and if you don't use it, you, it's no, you don't need that. You don't need to do that. But um, they, healthcare organizations, they have a very strict policy regarding that. And, and again, the insider threats, right? A lot of, a lot of different um, additional uh, threat vectors in, in addition to the two that I already mentioned. These are the threat actors, right? I think that a lot of the organizations, not only healthcare, um, are coming, right? It's all about phishing. I think we've seen so much phishing. We can keep doing education, education, ed education, but we still have to keep educating people. Um, example of phishing, right? Um, again, baiting the user, 
um, there's a uh, there's exploit. There's maybe some vulnerability. Again, maybe there's a Adobe Adobe vulnerability, or maybe there's a, um, another um, Oracle vulnerability. Um, again, it's baiting the user, exploiting that um, vulnerability, um, having a backdoor. So basically, it doesn't even have to. Um, the user does not even have to be logged in, right? Maybe they can be logged in, or they lock the screen. So there's a secondary payload that happens in the back end, and also when the user is no longer here, um, there's a back uh, back door or like a back uh, channel that happens, right, in the in the on their computer, and then there's a, a way to, to to steal all this information as well. So it's pretty interesting regarding the, the phishing as well. These are some of the attacker tools. I also found this from um, FireEye Mandians. Um, these are from actually 2014. But uh, these are some common backdoors and some, cr some common crimeware. They might be disguised as different names. They'll probably, probably be um, different names in the future as well. But right, for example, uh, Sogo, um, PlugX, right? Um, these are all backdoors. I won't go into specific detail on all of them. But take a look at like Photo, which is like a DLL that injects in DLL and kind of like does a key log of everything and installs on the service on a typical um, endpoints. Um, Home Unix, a generic launcher for plugins and different things like that as well. So it's pretty interesting. Some of the crimeware, right? They, they can be Zeus, right? Zeus, remember many years ago, or maybe a couple years ago, Zeus, the banking Trojan, looking at all of this confidential uh, financial information, right? J just as you know, right? Zeus can be programmed. There's a manual. There's kind of like a whole, actually, it's a whole business with the Zeus, right? Um, but pretty much Zeus can be designed to look for any kind of information that you program it. So it's really interesting, even though it, it was used initially for financial um, right, information, now it's been looking for healthcare, maybe looking for other information as well. Social, net, social networking, Facebook credentials, things like that. Um, other, other one I wanted to mention was kind of like the flashback um, RRC bot. So pretty, pretty interesting. And as you can see right here, there's some uh, information there about uh, remote access tools, right? Um, again, taking advantage of the information, and again, really recording stuff in the back end. Okay, so these, this was just, um, I, think, I think most of you have seen this, but um, there's Citadel, right? These are probably some of the, from 2014, 2013. Citadel, um, the black hole rat remote access tool. Um, and then also, I think on the back there was the, uh, I think that was the Zeus, one of the Zeus uh, um, Trojan, banking Trojans. So. So this, this was some interesting information regarding healthcare. Again, right, I think credit cards now, right, being stolen, it's the, the, the value of it is, is not as much anymore because so many, right, we've, we've, we've had uh, breaches, we've got notification, email notifications from different organizations, right, whether it be healthcare or not. And you can take a look, right, social security number now is about a dollar, right, because there's so many of them. And the medical information now is about $50, right? But think about all of the packaged information, including PII, so, um, the whole package of a, of a human being is about 50, uh, 500 to three, you know, to 1,300. That's a lot. That's why FBI mentioned this. And I think people in healthcare and people outside of healthcare, we know that we've been breached. And it, there, there's so much time, right? For example, 78% um, of the phishing email were actually IT or security related. And also they attempted, like the targeted the company's antivirus, right? You, you've seen it anti-fake antivirus, all of these different weird things coming in. And it's really interesting here, I wanted to mention, this was from Mandian as well, these are typical days of when phishing emails come in, right? So you can see maybe Monday, maybe people don't really, just coming from the weekend, so they don't really take a look at the emails, but these are some of the emails you can see, like right, Wednesday and Saturday are some of the, the a lot of the phishing emails come in. So, and also 72% uh, come in uh, during the weekdays. Interesting thing here, um, we've seen this, but 205 is the medium amount of days that a threat groups are present on the, on the, on the network, right? It's not only specific to healthcare, but, um, and also from 2013, uh, about 24 days less than 2013, right? So maybe, it, I guess it varies. And then 31% of the victims actually, uh, you know, discovered the breach manually, right? Sometimes it's coming from a third party. Um, again, they, it's really interesting. And 69 were notified by external entity, right? And it's probably going to even be more in the future as well. So it's, these are really interesting uh, statistics. Yes, Steve. Uh, I'm sorry, is that specific to the healthcare industry or is this, are these broader things? This I actually got from the healthcare, from uh, Mandian specifically. 
they did a um, presentation in um, I think early actually this year so they actually mentioned they mentioned about the good qu the question was um, is this specific to healthcare um, yes it is and um, basically Mandian took a look at all of the different breaches that they looked in healthcare so it's really interesting there and you can take a look at that uh, they had like a healthcare in intelligence brief as well so really interesting of the data that they found it'd be really interesting to see how uh, specifically what what additional data can be found from this as well. So case one, Anthem. So again, remember, this is a, a work in progress, but case one, I'm looking at any of these healthcare breaches that have affected one million uh, people or more uh, during this year. So we've heard about Anthem, right? I, I took this from the website. Anthem believes that this suspicious, suspicious activity may have occurred over the course of several weeks, right? Early in December 2014. I actually should have put a tilde there. But uh, this is from their website, so I got that. It actually was discovered by, um, discovered by Anthem on January 29, 2015, right? And it points to a database administrator credential being used, right? And um, I think a lot of people mentioned that, but right, some of the problems, and really there were 78.8 million uh, customers and, and uh, patients, so actually customers, and you can go to anthemfacts.com to get more information, but it's really, really interesting. Um, in, in terms of this, uh, again, this is all public information. I'm actually working this on this to give more information. But you know, some of the solutions include, and I'll, 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 in my last slide, I'll talk about some of the recommendations. But really, really having the, not only having executives accountable, but also having the organization as a whole. Right? It depends on your culture as well. But try to implement controls um, over privileged use accounts, for example especially right having like a two-factor authentication this may have at least brought the risk much much lower and having doing some due diligence right on on the organization as well right this was encrypted right maybe this database if it was encrypted maybe there would have been another alternative or another way of um, having it right non encrypting data is a clear violation of the high tech act as well right non encrypting data at, at rest so you know, just some things to 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 learn right i think that um for people that are in healthcare and also out of healthcare, a lot of good things that we can learn about this, and hopefully we can get a, a larger security budget with all these breaches. Case two, Primera Blue Cross was believed as early, was actually, uh, they believed that the attackers were on the system probably as early as December 2013. So, and then they probably discovered around, I think in 2015 sometime. And again, it points to user credentials being used. So probably again, probably like a, a phishing email. And again, user account management, and this one did about 11 million customers. So again, I think I would say for some of the solutions, um, very similar to, to what was the pre in the previous case. Uh, Care, Care First, right, recently, very recent, uh, believed as early as June 19th, 2014. And uh, discovered May 20th, 2015, right, last week right there. Again, it points to database uh, credentials being used. And also, right, some of the issues or the solutions might be user account uh, management, encryption, all of that. Um, but this, this one affected 1.1 million uh, customers. So it's really, really interesting. And as you can see, like, if you go down all these cases, right, look, all, the attackers have been on the network, right, over a year, maybe even longer. But or, or actually, six months or longer. And you can see from the kind of the relationship, what I'll have in the next um, in the future presentations is kind of like have the analysis of like how long and show the data points, which would be really interesting for um, executives as well. Okay, and to be case four, I, I'm um, still working on that, but basically uh, I wanted to, I didn't want to just pinpoint like uh, specific, um, you know, uh, specific healthcare organizations that have been breached. I wanted to actually do like from one million customers and more. And actually, I don't know if, if um, actually I want to go back here. Um, regarding Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield, how many people here are actually Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, Massachusetts members here, right? So, okay, so really interesting, right? So, regarding the Primera Blue Cross is really interesting because, number one, even though right they're they're mostly on the West Coast, but um, a lot of there's a lot of uh, talk about some of the customers here actually looked looking through threat intelligence. I saw some customers in in uh, Connecticut as well, and Massachusetts. And, and really interesting, and if you go to uh, Primera, I think there's a, a website, but you can kind of take a look. And so some of you that, that use the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts might be impacted as well. 
so it's good to actually sign up for like the, I think the all, all clear ID, um, kind of like a um, identity theft, identity credit monitoring, for example. It's pretty interesting. So just be, be, be aware of that. Okay. And then next one, this was actually from the Verizon data breach um, or incident response. They have a, a yearly survey of all the different, uh, you know, different um, incidents over the past year in different uh, verticals, in different industries. And for example, these were some of the recommendations for healthcare organizations, not only healthcare organizations, but other organizations as well. So for example, right, if you, if you go down and take a look, um, right, two-factor authentication, um, right, some of these are like from the, I think the SANS, there's some other stuff too, but the category percentage, 24%, but the, the, category, the category is, you know, visibility right there. So maybe you can't do two-factor authentication at first, but um, some of these you can do like a quick win. So the next one is the, right patching the web services. I think we've known that um, sometimes it's very tough to patch as well, right? It's all about patient care, but it's a quick win as well. Um, verify need for internet-facing devices. So again, think about all of these Internet of Things devices, right? Whether it be, I'll have a next slide about that too, but right, you can have the visibility when you are tracking that. Pro um, outbound traffic, web application testing, right? I, I, I won't go through all of these, but take a look at all the ones that are quick win versus all the ones that kind of like you can, um, you can actually improve your, your, your organization, whether it be healthcare or not. And then these, these were some recommendations that I had, just looking through all different uh, uh, stuff on the web and uh, different uh, webcasts and different, um, different reports as well. So again, I think like uh, Eric mentioned from his talk uh, yesterday, um, you, you really want to have a kind of like a, some kind of vulnerability management, some kind of model, whether it be high trust, ISO, NIST. I, for, for my organization, I, I really enjoy using high trust as well. It's a combination of everything, NIST, ISO, um, try to be secure. Don't only just follow like HIPAA privacy, HIPAA security, and, and think that you're, you're still secure. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, you just mentioned HIPAA there. I'm wondering what the mindset is with decision makers within, you know, the medical organizations. Are they, um, you know, they're, they're going to be forced by regulation to pay attention to HIPAA, but is the mindset change? Some of these things come out? Yeah, that's, um, so the, qu the question was, um, right, is the mindset changing for the healthcare organizations regarding, you know, different, different breaches and all that, right, or different security things. I would say that it, it depends on the culture, right? Um, cost benefit as well. Um, sometimes it's really very important to get in front of the board to basically, you know, kind of like um, let, let the board know what's going on in security, right? Make it very simple, easy to understand, but uh, try to, so I would say in response to your question, it, it really depends. It depends on the culture, depends on how many users, depending on, um, and then sometimes, sometimes the providers or the, the providers have a lot of say. So trying to get security champions from all different uh, industry department levels as well. Not only working with management, just trying to, um, like, like what I would try to say is, try to give them guidance on how they can be safe in the organization and be safe at home as well. Try to be not only just security, 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 but try to weigh that as well. So I would say that that's, um, that would be the answer to that one. Um, recommendations, there's, uh, again, try to follow a model, right? Whether it be high trust, high trust, ISO, NIST, whatever it might be, try, follow that and make sure Eric mentioned from the vulnerability, vulnerability maturity model, right? Maybe you can follow that. And you want to continu continually, continuously measure and improve your, your, your vulnerability management and, and, and your processes, for example. Data classification, right? I think we all know, we want to ensure that we, you know where all the crown jewels are, right? Healthcare organizations, it's a data, right? You, you saw on the previous slide, it's 500 to 1300 per record. That's just like a, a tilde, that's just a little bit how much it costs, but think about all of the minors, all the different uh, children that were uh, impacted, right? From the Anthem, from the Primera, from all the different uh, healthcare breaches as well. Use two-factor authentication. I think that, uh, again, maybe you want to segregate and, and, and look and use two-factor authentication on the really critical assets on your crown jewels first. Maybe on your IT, 
all the people that have administrative access, for example, maybe your IT personnel, try to use that first and then try to slowly, slowly move it into like uh, the workforce as well. But again, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of patience as well. And again, um, a lot of third parties, I think you, you've seen from the Verizon data breach, is there, um, v, uh, DBIR 2015, um, you want to secure, take a look at the remote access third parties, right? A lot of breaches are also happening, not only from the phishing, but also from the third parties. For example, your organization is really secure, but all of a sudden there is a third party where you have a BIA, business associate agreements, but they install some kind of open source or very vulnerable application and you don't see it, right? So kind of have the logs, have the video, whatever it might be. Take a look at that. Application whitelisting, sometimes very tough, right? But try to know uh, I think a lot of the organizations here, or a lot of the presentations now are, are aimed at the behavior analysis, right? It's not going to be working all the time, but it's starting. It's starting, right? Antivirus is pretty much, works probably about 50% of the time, right? But you want to know what is on your systems. You want to know what is, what should be running, what should not be running. And you also want to manage and monitor privilege usage, privileges, um, privilege accounts versus other accounts as well, right? Um, data encryption, remove the data if it's not, not needed, right? You, of course you can encrypt the data, but sometimes it's much more, much more complicated. Uh, maybe you want, you want to de-identify the data, and also maybe you want to remove the data if it's, if it's not needed. And education, education, education. You can keep educating people, and um, I want to mention also identity access management, um, identity um, access management as well. And here were some other recommendations regarding hiring the, right, making sure that empowering all of your executives, not only executives, but also all of your um, workforce as well, to make sure that they understand um, different security practices. So for example, when they are, are uh, questioned to make a security decision, whether at, in the organization or at home, they can make the right decision. Um, improve board and stakeholder oversight, right? Um, be proactive. I think uh, we've seen a lot of the different uh, presentations mentioning be proactive. There's no more being reactive anymore. Probably the healthcare organization is already has a breach, or the attacker is already on the, or attacker or attackers are already on the, on the on the network. So it's your job to kind of be really ready for all if, when this happens. Um, there's different, uh, you know, different organizations that you would work with as well. But uh, how many people? I think. Um, Dr. Schwartz mentioned this as well, but National Health Information Sharing Analysis Center, we need to work with more of these ISACs as well. There's different ISACs in different organizations, not only healthcare, there's a financial one, there's many ones, so we need to kind of participate in trusted entities as well. So it's really interesting there. And um, that was all for that. Yep, th that was all, that's all. Any questions? Yes, sir. Just, I guess just a couple, uh, Comment. One, uh, other healthcare, I know there are a bunch of other people, but anybody wants to link up afterwards and exchange contact information. So, as healthcare people can kind of talk, come to me and I can get information together. And I guess the second comment I had was in, in thinking about um, uh, kind of the healthcare threat space. Yep. You know, I, I guess two sources of data the rise of EBIR, for example, especially last year, when they sort of broke out the percentage of Yes. Um, uh, by different uh, threat patterns, you know, you can kind of get a sense of where you're most likely to reach based on that data to help prioritize your actions. I think that's one sort of exactly. thing. Look at that and find that, like, a, uh, uh, I think it's like theft and loss. Sure. Number one. Right. Number right. So that can help prioritize. The other source of data is um, from the HHS, the wall, the quote unquote wall of shame. Yes, the wall of shame, right. Yeah. yeah. So actually download that stuff into a spreadsheet or an analysis on that. And if you take a look at that, a lot of that, you know, basically the data lines up pretty well with the EBIR as far as likely and stuff. Just some thoughts on kind of how to prioritize what we need to worry most about. Because the fact of the matter is that a lot of the, a lot of the breaches we hear about are sure. relatively rare in the healthcare scene, although they're massively impactful. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. And, and um, to add to your points, um, one of the things that I've been doing also is looking at, at a lot of the, the threat intelligence feeds. It's right. kind of like trusted, right? There's so much different data that's coming in. 
and I'm actually looking at different feeds. And the hard part is there's so much, right? It keeps piling, piling, piling. And how do they relate to healthcare as well? And how can I use that? Or actually, um, I actually probably didn't mention that, but um, uh, automate. How do I automate a lot of the different things as well in there? And um, so, yeah, really interested to, to talk um, healthcare trusted as well. And, and it will be really interesting because it's kind of like a call to action. We need more. Um, the bad guys, right, the attackers, they, they're so well, so good in conversing, right, whether it be underground or wherever it might be. And us as, as the good guys, we need to really communicate more and also kind of, I think, um, share some of the data, right, in, in a trusted entity or model as well. So, and any other questions or? All right, great. And this is just a plug, Mass Hackers Beacon this Saturday. Anyone interested? And in, oh, oh, since I'm, uh, I'll be talking with Ming, Ming Chao, um, talking about computer science curricula um, with, you know, <coughs> integrating information security into computer science and all of that. And so you can search for Mass Hackers Beacon. So great, um, I have more resources as well. And these, these will all be shared. A lot of my stuff has been from the M-Trends and the Verizon DVR, as you mentioned. And um, there's the HHS as well. And like you mentioned, the wall of shame, HHS, right? So really, really interesting. So we need to all work together to uh, help, um, especially the healthcare industry, be more secure. So great, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>